So I covered up the name of the species um, to see if anyone might be able to figure out what it is. I'm just going to take a minute. I apologize, but I, for some reason, can't seem to bring up. Oh, I've got it. So now I've got the window with the chat. So if any of you guys have anything to say, I'll be able to see it now. Okay. Um, but if we see this, it starts in January here, and we can see the animated map of where these birds are throughout the year. Um, so this is a single species. Um, so here in January, you can see they're down in Florida and other southern regions. And then you have one resident population in Florida here. And every, yes, <laughs> we already got it in the chat there. But yeah, so this is the sandhill crane. Um, but the reason that this is so important, um, it's a really cool visualization and it's impressive and fun to engage people with. But we can also see where these birds are in highest abundance so we can prioritize lands that they need during like, their migration. Um, and then, of course, wildlife viewing is also incredibly important to the economy. So when I started learning about how wildlife viewing supports um, different economic things, I was so impressed by this report from 2011, where I found out that there are actually more jobs in the wildlife viewing industry in Florida um, than there are jobs in the airline industry in Florida. So that is just really a statistic that blew me away. Uh, in 2011, the last time we have all this data from, there were actually almost $3 billion that were generated by wildlife viewers. Um, and for me, the bottom line isn't dollar signs, it's conservation. But for a lot of people having that extra incentive where they can see dollar signs from conserving pieces of land, that really helps provide an incentive for general conservation. Um, and then of course in rural areas where there might not be other tourist attractions, these wild spaces are a really great way to bring folks in. Um, and one other factor, that's been cited in the literature a lot is that uh, wildlife viewing tourism is much more resilient than other forms of tourism. And unfortunately, we've experienced this in the last year. Um, so especially uh, during the time of the pandemic, there have been headlines about how more and more people are getting involved in birding and other outdoor forms of recreation. Um, so there have been shortages on camping equipment, REI, and people have been selling binoculars at record rates. Um, and part of this is that people really do feel more uncomfortable or more comfortable with outdoor tourism than they would with places that are more crowded or indoors. So unfortunately, especially important right now. Um, and then one of the other bottom lines is that wildlife viewing really gets people to care more about what they're seeing. Because if you're out there and you're having these personal connections with the landscape and with the birds and other wildlife there, you can't help but become more of an advocate for those spaces. And of course, um, we can look at how land use is projected to change, especially in the state of Florida. I mean, we've got, in the past, we had about 900 people a day who are moving to the state. Um, and by 2060, we we're projected to double the population. Um, and with that, we're going to be developing about 7 million acres of land. You can see here, um, the orange is the current use. And then in 2060, it's going to double. Um, so we really need to have people who are interested in conservation and in developing in the smartest ways possible uh, while protecting some of our most important lands and species. Uh, you may remember this news from last year. I, I know this made it outside the birding world and the ornithology world a little bit, but last year's study showed that since 1970, we've lost 3 billion individual birds about. Um, so the population of birds has gone down by an astronomical number. Um, and really these two species are kind of our canary in the coal mine because they're so interconnected with everything else, one, and also because people are so interested in viewing them, we have great data on how their populations are changing. Um, and having people really invested in bird watching can be a great way to, to make sure that we're in tune with the way that things are going. Um, so to jump from why we do what we do to what we actually do, um, the Great Florida Birding Wildlife Trails mission sort of echoes the mission of FWC in general, um, in that we're trying to conserve and enhance Florida's wildlife habitat. Um, the main things that we do are promoting wildlife viewing activities, so uh, both events and places that people can go birding, um, conservation education, which unfortunately used to once involve uh, actual educational in-person programs, but that's sort of on hold. Um, but we do have online outreach that we do over social media and through a newsletter. 
um, and economic opportunity. So really that sort of ecotourism piece of the picture, but always with the end goal of conservation. We've got 500 sites on the trail, over 500 sites, and I'm sure that you all, since you think about highway signs and things like that, have probably seen the swallowtail type signs around. Uh, we have everything from national wildlife refuges, national parks, state parks, county, city parks, national forests, state forests, college campuses, uh, military bases, and our own wildlife management areas. There's really a broad swath of places that fit the description of a place that is acceptable for the birding and wildlife trail. And we try to keep a wide range of things so that they're pretty well spaced out and represented well in all counties. Um, and then we also provide print and online resources, which I'll touch on a little bit later, um, and do a little bit of educational programming as well. Um, so I don't know if anyone is familiar with the history of birding trails. And I have to confess that I was not before I came into this position with SWC. Um, but the first birding trail was one piece of the Texas Birding Trail put together in 1996, it was finished. Um, and this was conceived as one area with a series of smaller loops. Um, so you can see here in pink or magenta, we've got this royal turn that's screaming at um, a loop, a suggested driving loop where you can go from place to place over the course of a day or a few days to, to hit a bunch of birding places in an area. Um, and you can see also, I adore their maps of these. And if you're interested in checking them out, you can uh, look at their website and you can actually order giant print editions of these. So if anyone is a birder who's interested in Texas, I can share that with you. Um, but birding trails like this can actually now be found in 36 US states um, and a couple of Canadian provinces. And a lot of them, like the Texas birding trail, like the Florida birding trail, um, others like the Idaho birding trail and the Missouri birding trail, are state agency run, but other ones are run by nonprofits or uh, just groups of individuals who put them together. Some of them are huge. Um, we're at 500 sites. I think Virginia right now is over 900 um, and have a lot of partners and are very involved. And some of them are just maps that people have put together of the best places to go birding that you can access online. So there's a huge variety, but it's definitely continuing to grow. Um, the Birding and Wildlife Trail itself, uh, we were right on the heels of Texas after they finished in 1996 and began planning our trail system in 1997. Um, so the initial funding for the project was a very generous grant from the Federal Highway Administration of $1.86 million. Um, and we were able to use that to put up over 1,600 signs around the state. So 500 sites, 1,600 signs. We've got maybe three to five signs directing folks to each site. Um, so of course they start on a, a more primary road and sort of direct you down more scenic highways to get to where you're going. Um, and we do have to replace these about every 10 years to deal with reflectivity issues. Um, if you recall on the Texas birding trail, it was sort of more like what I've seen with the scenic highways where they have a suggested driving route. Um, and they sort of explain how long it takes to get from point A to point B with a recommended time frame. What we did with the birding trail is we just organized all of our sites into clusters. So if you, this is cluster A, for example, in I believe the South region. Um, and so all of these sites here are within driving distance of each other, but we don't necessarily suggest a loop. Um, some of them, some of our sites, we have nine of them that are our gateway sites. Um, and those are places that are really extra outstanding in terms of birding places might be more famous and places where people from out of state are already going so that they'll see that that's on the birding trail and maybe get interested in some of the smaller sites and they tend to have more resources like large visitor centers and a lot of programming um, and then a few of our sites were originally dedicated as worth a stop sites so um, more of a place where if you're driving from a larger site to another larger site, you might want to stop at a little park because um, there might be something interesting to see, but not a ton there. So to be on the trail, number one, obviously all of our sites are selected for birding and wildlife viewing opportunities. So these are places where you might have rare birds, a great amount of bird diversity. Um, and the, the wildlife part of great birding and wildlife trail is added in a little bit later. Um, but some of our sites are also really well known for butterflies or reptiles or things like that. But of course, usually if you have a healthy ecosystem or a nice piece of land, you're going to get the birds and the wildlife together. Uh, it's also important to note that we've got sites for all interests and abilities. 
So the Bergen Trail is useful for, I think, birders at most levels. Um, some people who are really into it prefer to use eBird to look for places to go birding or word of mouth, um, or just have regular places that they like getting up over and over. Um, so a lot of it is sort of directed to people who are getting started. So they might, we have some places that are friendlier, more family friendly, uh, visitor friendly, have plenty of visitor centers and amenities. Um, and some of our sites, like our wildlife management areas, are a little bit more off the beaten path. Um, so it might be for someone who would prefer a more rustic rural experience where they're not going to see any other people. Um, so we, we do note that in all of our descriptions. And we are working on creating a scale called a wild factor uh, so that people can get a really quick idea of what kind of site it is. Uh, we also have print and online resources. Um, so we do offer the checklist of Florida's birds which is just a, a booklet where you can check off everything you've seen with the date and some notes if you'd like. Um, and we used to offer these print versions of our guides. So we're divided into four sections. We've got Panhandle, East, West, and South. Um, and each one of those used to have an accompanying printed guide where you could actually open it up like a brochure and read the descriptions and see maps of all the places. And I'm very happy to announce that we are currently right in the middle of um, reprinting and redesigning all those guides. Um, so the graphic designer we're working with is about halfway through the process and we are about I think nine tenths of the way to our fundraising goal for that so we're really excited about getting that underway so we can get them out to folks and is that something that you're interested in or uh, some other organization you think might be interested in handing them out we're going to be delivering them for free and you'll be able to order them online uh, from our website. Um, we also offer on our website this trip planning tool, uh, and I'm going to pull it up, I think, in our browser. So here's our website with our absolutely lovely Florida scrub jay. I adore this bird. Um, but if you navigate to our trip planner here, you can you have an interactive map of the state where you can sort of look at, uh, say so you want to go to a place that has camping available, and it's in the west region. Um, you can really easily search just visually for different places. So all of these sites that you see here offer camping. Um, and if you click on them, you can see the short description, contact information, some of the more popular birds people look for that you can find there, as well as any other amenities. So it's, we're looking on improving this tool in the future. Um, unfortunately, this isn't mobile friendly, so it doesn't work very well on your cell phone, which of course is becoming more and more popular for folks. So I think we're gonna try to revamp it in the next couple of years. But for now, it's still pretty useful too. Um, so we also, we've been interested lately on how people use the trail. Because um, as I just mentioned, I mean, technology is changing the way that people make their travel decisions. Um, the last time we surveyed users about how they use our resources was in 2012, and a lot has changed since then. Um, so just this summer, we put together a survey where we surveyed uh, attitudes towards general birding and also to the birding trail. Um, we had about 3,000 people respond to this survey. Uh, we learned a lot about what they're doing, and I was really surprised by a lot of the findings. Um, so our guides, our printed guides, did actually really influence decisions. It was a strong influence for 93% of respondents. Um, I wasn't particularly surprised by the things that people wanted most of the site. So um, for these birders, it's bird diversity, bird rarity is the top one. Uh, the ability to see other wildlife at a site. Um, and I was also surprised by what people were looking at. We had folks who were interested in seeing insects and even moths and sometimes spiders were listed in responses. So it's really nice to see that people are interested in such a wide diversity of wildlife. Um, and walking paths were all, like, always highly rated. So places where you can really get out and explore the site. Um, in terms of infrastructure that people prefer at birding trail sites, um, trail maps were number one, so that on those places where people like those winding trails, they don't get lost, they know where they're going, they can plan out their adventure. Um, boardwalks, so of course, are really excellent. Benches for resting, visitor centers for information, and restrooms are always, of course, key if you're going to be spending a whole day anywhere looking for birds. Uh, and then one of the big questions we had is whether or not these signs really matter. Um, because originally we had that almost $2 million grant to get everything engineered and put in, but we don't have that kind of money anymore. Um, and 
we're, we're excited to keep putting them up and keep replacing them as long as people are using them. So I'm really happy to have the data that, yes, the signs do indeed matter to our visitors. 72% um, of folks just take same-day impromptu trips to birding trail sites based on these signs. Um, and 83% of users have seen them when going somewhere and made a plan to go back there and then followed through. So people are really using them, and we're going to keep finding money to get them replaced and get them up there. Um, and replace them when they get vandalized, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so moving forward, I know a lot of folks have been asking about uh, potential nominations and adding new sites to the trail. In the last couple of years, I've heard a lot about this, so I'm very excited that we're going to be moving forward with a new nominations process in 2021. Um, the main things that we're looking for on the site, uh, potential sites, are really just wildlife diversity, um, hands down, ease of access, so places that people will actually be able to go. Um, we've had a couple issues with sites that used to have lots of hours or stuff, and they've since shut down areas of, of those sites or they're the kind of places that are only open on a Tuesday by appointment. Um, so those kind of places can sometimes frustrate trail users because they can be really difficult to get to. Um, and then another big one that we've always considered when adding sites to the trail is whether or not they can support people um, because as much as we want people getting out and exploring these places, we don't want to put the sites themselves or the wildlife that live there at risk. Um, so a great example is something like a leaf turn. Um, places where these birds are breeding during the breeding season really do have to be shut down to, to foot traffic and to car traffic and to dogs and just because it's a, it's a sensitive and vulnerable habitat. Um, so we do take that into account when we are adding something to the trail. Um, and if you guys are interested in being on a mailing list about the future of this process, um, or if you're interested in really any other resources um, that we could maybe provide to you that I mentioned today, feel free to shoot me an email at um, liz.hold at myfwc.com. Um, I can pop that in the chat right now. And then I'll also be sure to leave up the last question slide for a while so you can write that at my phone number down. Um, but feel free to reach at any time. I love talking birding trail. I love talking birding in general. All right. Um, are there any questions for me? Thank you guys for listening to me talk for a while. It's always great to chat about the birding trail to new people. I don't, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box, but if uh, anybody has any questions they want to verbalize, feel free to to state them. You'll also need to unmute yourself before the question as well. Uh, I have a question. If I may, how, how early in 2021 would we see this new nomination process? Um, we're planning, we're piloting it right now. Um, so we're in the process of recruiting volunteers in the panhandle, and we're going to we're going to have volunteers go out and evaluate them, have staff go out and evaluate the same sites, and then make sure that our evaluation process isn't totally off the wall and difficult to interpret. But I'm hoping that by summer we'll be able to do it, um, maybe to have the nominations open even earlier. But we're planning to do the evaluations themselves during fall because we really don't want to short shrift anything by sending volunteers out in the summer. Because uh -huh. <laughs> I think that yeah. would probably bias evaluations. We want fall migration and we don't want it to be miserably hot. Yeah, things tend to disappear in the summer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, hey, Liz, as a follow up to that, so, so if Martin were to nominate a site, you guys go out and review it, how long does the decision making process take? I would anticipate that uh, if we were to have them reviewed in the fall, we would know by early winter at the latest which ones are going to be on there because it's going to be relatively cut and dry. Um, yeah. It shouldn't be too hard to figure it out. Um, yeah, and if anyone is interested in seeing an example of a nomination form, I would be happy to send you uh, the most recent version that we have on hand. Uh, and anyone can nominate a site. It's open to the general public, but we do need um, a sign off from the site manager, whether it be the county parks and rec or just the, the manager of a state park or something like that. So there, so there has to be an agency support somehow, county, park manager, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just need acknowledgement that they know that they're on the trail, really. Sure. In case we have okay. anything like a safety issue in the future. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll shoot you an email then, get, get a get copy. 
Yes, please do. Hey, Liz, do sights come off the trail? Um, it's been a long time since the sights come off. Really, the only issue that we have is occasional safety issues. Um, and as I said, we did start the trail back in 1997. So I think there was one instance before my time where it just was very poorly managed and uh, became a site where there was a feral cat colony. So it was very active and taken over by invasive species um, and just was no longer no longer fit the original criteria that matched the nomination. But for the most part, um, sites that have been nominated, uh, they've maintained the commitment to keep it an awesome place for birding. Right. Uh, but if they turn it into a parking lot, that's, yeah. That, yeah, or if it becomes unsafe. Yeah. Okay, I see I see Michael By Byerly has a question. Go ahead, Michael. You'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah, though. yeah I, I was wondering, it sounds like you have to do maybe some fundraising to be able to replace signs, is that right? Mm -hmm. Um, in the past, we've managed to find some funding within FWC, but I think next year we are going to have to reach out to groups to help us find funding for new signs. I, I just had an, an idea. I, the old signs, when you replace them, what do you do with those old signs? It, could it be that you could find local artists that might, for instance, turn that old sign into a piece of artwork, a bird, uh, especially whatever trail it comes from? You know, they could do a painting on the backside. And <laughs> And, oh, and then it could be sold and that might be enough to replace the sign or maybe even more. Um, and I would imagine there's a lot of local artists who would love to be able to to do something along those lines. Oh, that is such a great idea. I want to thank you so much for that. Um, we have had the idea of selling signs before that we've had to take down. Usually they just kind of get lost in an FDOT warehouse somewhere. Yeah. Um, I don't know where they end up, but um, we thought about selling them, but then we would worry that people might put them up somewhere um, yeah. at a place that's not a burning trail site. But if they turned into a piece of art, that would be absolutely brilliant. I'm going to, right after this, I'm going to go talk to my team because I think everyone's going to be really excited about that idea. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yay. Um, and I saw one question in the chat too uh, that I don't want to necessarily let go. Um, so asking about where we can find trails that are wheelchair accessible. Um, so we do have... Um, on the trip planner, pull that up again. Um, we go back to the beginning. One of the things we have is handicap accessibility, but unfortunately this isn't incredibly descriptive. Um, so one of the things that we're really interested in getting more information on um, is what kind of things are accessible there, because this might mean an accessible parking lot and a half mile accessible trail where other places might have a lot more to offer. So. We want it to really be something where if you're going to go based on the information we provide and expect something that's handicapped accessible, it's not just being able to go into the visitor center. It's actually being able to enjoy the site. Um, and one other thing that uh, there's a project that Audubon has put together um, that we would like to advertise more just to really help it get off the ground. And it's called Birdability. Um, and it is an, this interactive database that anyone can add to um, really whether or not you, you have challenges with accessibility personally. Um, but my computer's quite slow today. Um, if you zoom in on any site really, yeah. we don't have too many in Florida, unfortunately. So people can enter information, detailed information about what is accessible at any given site. So this is hopefully something that we'll be able to incorporate in the future to get better information out to folks. Right. I'll stop bothering you with other extraneous stuff on my other screen now. Is that state and federal? Um, it is. That one is not controlled by sites themselves. Um, so it's really just user added data. So it's not necessarily 100% accurate, but um, I think in terms of a database, it's the best available information that we have right now. Okay, thank you. So I see Dan McCormick has his hand up. Go ahead, Dan. You're on mute. Dan, you're muted. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure it was an excellent question you had too. There that microphone on. There he goes. Okay. Yes. What I what I wanted to find out. Uh, one of the impression that there's a section 
of the birding trail, if not two sections here in Sumter County. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to know where to, where to look to reference to find them. But the specific uh, question about the signs, would you, would the FWC have an inventory of where they're supposed to be? I'm interested in seeing that we have them out there, but I don't know where to go look for know what if I'm if there would be a sign somewhere or not without that information. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so we do actually have a a database of the locations of all the signs. Unfortunately, we don't have a map, so you can't see the locations. But the descriptions that we have are fairly good. Um, so they'll tell you where it is on a mile marker on a major road or something like that. Um, in terms of Sumter, let me pull up. I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head, but I can tell you which sites are on there and hopefully they're familiar. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have the Florida Bass Conservation Center, Lake Panasofsky. Uh, Marsh Bend Outlet Park and the Upper Whippleseechee River all are all our sites in Hunter County. Uh, yeah, is that is that sounds like three signs? Is that correct? Um, it probably so for each one. There's probably about three to five signs uh, directing folks to them, and potentially one at the entrance as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'll see you an email when we're done. If you just pop your email in the chat or shoot me an email, um, I'll make sure that I give you the list of locations for those signs. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and if I'm understanding correctly now, to nominate, I guess we're talking about nominating locations along the existing trail. For instance, uh, you mentioned wheelchairs. We have mm -hmm. a park on... Uh, Lake Okahumka, and I'm unfortunate it's probably not on the birding trail. It, maybe it should be. But there are some good trails in there that could potentially be wheelchair accessible trails within that park. And there's a lot of a lot of uh, underbrush and all that uh, is real conducive to small birds. Small birds. Uh, oh yeah, would, would such a park if it were not on the trail itself be eligible for nomination? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so really anything can be nominated as, as long as it's a place where you can view birds and wildlife, it's safe and people can get to it. Um, yeah. They won't necessarily all be accepted onto the trail, right? certainly, but, but we're happy to accept nominations for just about any place. Does it help any if you find one and it uh, appears to be a good place, and like the one I'm talking about being wheelchair accessible and whatnot. Uh, if locally we can raise money for the signs, signage, would that have any influence? Um, so we wouldn't. We don't want it to be a pay-to-play right, right, with right, the right. application. Right. Uh, Are you so trying to bribe her, Dan? Are you trying to? I think Dan's trying to bribe you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just. I'm trying to augment the value of our site for the purpose. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so just to be clear, it's um, the uh, acceptance of sites on the trails is by in no way contingent on people being able to play, pay for extensive right, signage. Right, um, <laughs> but we would yeah. never say no. <laughs> good answer, good answer. Yeah, well, I guess what I'm getting at is if, a, if it's a good site, said that you don't have unlimited money for signage on goods where well just say on existing trail for instance mm -hmm. uh, and that was a that that was a factor because it doesn't do much good to have a trail if it's not well enough identified that people can when they get there they can tell that's what they were looking at on the internet mm -hmm. Yeah, those signs, said, those signs to me are they they kind of you say, oh yeah, look, this is part of the birding trail. You know, we, because sometimes people will, who hike and whatnot get there without they're not looking for the birding trail, but then when they find it, it's an additional incentive to go on the trail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, and when we have people discover a place that they visit all the time and they suddenly notice that birding trail sign and look it up, that is a way yeah. that sometimes people find out about us. 
yeah. Um, yeah, moving forward, it will be a financial challenge to get signage up at new sites, um, especially because I'm sure as a lot of you who work with the scenic byways know, it's, it's the cost of implementing, like engineering the signs uh, and getting all the planning done. The panels themselves are about $30 a piece. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to have an entrance sign at each site. So when you arrive, you know you're at the birding trail. But um, if we can't find money to defray the cost of new uh, new signage on the highways and road systems, um, we may ask for sites or counties uh, to help pay for some of that signage, um, so it's sort of the directing you from the major roads to the site itself. Well, if we could get enough approved birding trail sites in Sumter County that are on the state list and whatnot, um, I feel like from past experience, having served on the Tourism Development Council, uh, and had some positive feedback from some of them, including the chairman, uh, that we might be able to uh, get some local signage and all if it's if if they feel like it's okay, so it's been approved by the state. It's on the it's on the maps. The state's gotten all now. We want to mark it out so people can find it and enjoy it. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, and one other way that you can save money on it too that we've done it at a number of our sites in the past is just co-locating signs. So there's already signs for a park, um, and there's a way that we can fit the birding trail sign on that same post um, yeah. without a whole lot of rigor mole. That can that can make things yeah. a lot easier as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, my pleasure. Thank you for your questions, Dan. Um, I had one question here from Bill Klein too uh, about Chain of Lakes Parks in Titusville. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear more about Chain of Lakes Park if you want to send me some pictures, um, and I can send you the nomination form if that's something you'd be interested in. Hey, um, Kevin Schott was on the call earlier and i'm not sure if he's still there and i know kevin had forwarded a couple of questions or a couple of comments maybe to claudia earlier in the week kevin did you get your questions answered if you're still out there and do you do you want to continue do you want to still yeah. post the list maybe not yeah i think i still see him on here but yeah he's quiet that's all right well, this is awesome. We've got some things in the chat box. I'm going to go down real quick and make sure we don't miss anything. Uh, Liz, you can see that too, right? The chat box? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So lots of lots of congratulations and thank you. Um, the birding app, we address that. Oh, yes. Um, it's called eBird. I'll pop that in the chat too. It's um, eBird is one that's really great if you are already a birder. Um, or if you're a beginning bird or two, it doesn't help at all with identification of birds. Um, but the other app, which I'm also putting in here, um, it's called Merlin. And you don't have to take a photograph of a bird because that's difficult. <laughs> uh, they're fly a lot. It's a lot easier to take like plant pictures. Um, but you, if you have a description of the bird, it asks you a few simple questions and uses your, your location to narrow down um, to just a handful of species that it could be. So it's really, really cool resource if you're interested in getting started with birding. Okay. And then Bill Klein says he sees a lot of birds in the chain of lakes in Titusville. And he'd be glad to send you some pictures if you're interested. I would love them. I would love those. Okay. Um, okay, well, that's... That is all the questions and comments that I see. So if there's nothing else, I'm just going to go into my closing statement. So Liz, thank you so much. This was wonderful and we had a lot of engagement. Um, I like to remind everybody that, you know, along the byways, um, you know, it's not just the road, it's, it's so much more to the byway than just being on the road. So you can get off the beaten path and, and explore, go birding. And uh, Liz, all the resources you shared with us today, and we appreciate it, the tools and the resources. Uh, if you have any questions or any feedback, I would love to hear from you. I can put my email address in the chat box if you don't already know it. <laughs> um, I also wanted to let you all know 
that uh, I have a presentation coming up in December that I want you to know about. It's it's with uh, the transportation symposium. It's virtual. You will need to register. I uh, also put that link into the chat box. And the topic I'll be discussing is the Florida Scenic Highway Program today, tomorrow, and beyond. Um, so look for that. It's December 15th from 9 a.m. till 10 p.m. And you'll have to register, like I said. So the lastly, if you have any ideas and you want to see us put that on, let me know and we'll we'll research it and, and get it going. Uh, so once again, Liz, you were phenomenal. Fabulous Thanks, presentation. Very Thank engaging. you all. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah, and thank you all so much for coming. All right, you guys have a good one. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Be safe. Bye. 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 Thank you.